Father in heaven, we thank you for the fact that redemption is available through Christ. And uh, Father, I'm thankful for one, that you have redeemed me. And I know that echoes the voice of many in this room. I hope that before this service is over, it would reflect every person in this room. So Lord, we pray for those here today who perhaps have believed a false gospel or have a false sense of assurance or in some way or another, they're trusting in something other than Christ for their salvation. So Lord, I pray today as we discuss your righteousness and the beautiful picture and reality of imputation that you would help us to see just what you have done for us and how beautiful it is. Lord, may our minds be attentive and our ears listen. I pray for our hearts to be receptive and that we would all receive the Word of God this morning as the Word of God and not as a mere word of man. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'd like to invite you to go ahead and open your Bibles this morning. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 4, so please find your place there in Romans chapter 4. Romans 4, the title of this morning's message is God's Righteousness Revealed. So in this morning's passage of Scripture, we are going to see the righteousness of God, and we're also going to see how God makes sinners righteous before Him. God's righteousness is revealed, and then God is going to show us how we are made righteous before Him. Now, one of the things Romans chapter 4 is going to do, it's going to talk about what does not produce righteousness, and then what does produce righteousness. If you've been with us thus far in the book of Romans, it'll be a little bit repetitive, but this is doctrine. This is theology. These are things that we need to learn. These are things that we need to be grounded in. And not only that, we need to be willing to teach these things to others. It's, it's important that, uh, we get, that we get beyond the milk and that we get into the meat of God's Word. And that's one of the reasons I'm preaching through Romans is so that we will get into the meat of the Word of God. Now, what I have felt led to do this morning is to preach... The entire chapter of Romans 4. I'm not going to read all of the chapter to begin with. We'll work our way through it as we go. But I am going to read verses 1 through 12 to begin with. And then I'm going to show you why I am preaching this as one unit. Even though many of your Bibles have it broken down into two units. As a matter of fact. Many of you will have the heading above chapter 4, a heading like this, Abraham justified by faith. Am I right? In the heading of your Bible, do you see something like that? And then more than likely, you're going to see a second heading right above verse 13 that says something to the effect, the promise revealed through faith. Am I correct? Do you have two headings in this chapter? All right. If you don't, great. If you do... Um, I'm going to show you why I'm not preaching this as two different units. But first, let's read verses 1 through 12. Paul writes, What shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as what is due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteous apart from works. And then he quotes David here from the Old Testament. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count, will not count his sin. Is this blessing only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? 
We say that faith was, there's that word again, faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? Was it not after? I'm sorry, was it not? uh, It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. So that righteousness would be counted to them as well. Notice that word counted again. To make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So a lot of talk about counted, circumcised, uncircumcised, faith. And so my job this morning is to help us understand. Now, I want you to notice why I'm preaching the entire chapter. Do you see that three-letter word at the beginning of verse 13? For, F-O-R, in the ESV. In the Greek text, that is the Greek word gar. Gar. Gar is a connecting word. It connects units of thought. So instead of having two different units of thought, we have you one unit of thought that is connected by that Greek word, gar. It's one of the things I'm teaching Ashton right now, our youth pastor, is, is how gar is used throughout the Bible. It's a connecting word. So what happens is, is 13 and following is connected to what we just read by that Greek word, Gar, translated for in your Bible. So now you know my reasoning behind preaching the whole chapter. I I want you to notice that because one of the things I hope to do when I'm preaching is not only to preach, but also to explain to you why I'm preaching a certain passage. And uh, not only that, but things you can look for when you're studying your Bible. Four. I'll also be honest with you, when I was studying the sermon this week and knowing or knowing that I would be talking about imputation, I searched for an illustration to properly illustrate what it means to have imputed righteousness. And I searched and I studied all week and I found many illustrations, but none of them I felt to be adequate. As a matter of fact, I drove seven hours yesterday. My wife and my kids spent seven hours behind a windshield of a vehicle yesterday. My body's feeling it today um, to preach my grandmother's funeral. But the whole time I was thinking in my mind, I even talked to Kelly. I said, I've got to, I need to find an illustration, a way to illustrate imputation. This morning in my office, I was praying through it. It was the last minute. And of course, the Lord made me feel quite foolish when I was reminded that the best illustration of imputation is found in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement. Do you remember the, what the Old Testament teaches about the Day of Atonement? You can find this in Leviticus 16. I don't want you to turn there right now, but... One of the most important passages on the Day of Atonement is Leviticus 16. And in the Jewish life or the Hebrew life, the Day of Atonement was known as the Day of Days. It was the, it was the day when the high priest would offer a sacrifice on behalf of the whole nation. First, the high priest would offer up a bull for his own sacrifice. Before he could go into the Holy of Holies in order to sacrifice on behalf of the people, he first had to make a sacrifice for himself. So he would sacrifice a bull. And then after that symbolic purification, he would then take two goats. One goat was to be sacrificed, and the other goat was known as the scapegoat. So on the Day of Atonement, 
the high priest would offer up one goat as a sacrifice. He would go into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle the blood of the goat on the horns of the altar. And then he would sprinkle it into the Holy of Holies on the mercy seat. And then he would come out before the people and he would lay his hands on the other goat. He would put his hand right there on the head of that goat. And then he would pray with his hands on that goat, confessing the sins of the nation. And then that goat would be let free to go into the wilderness. Now, what are those two goats a picture of? The sacrifice for sin and the forgiveness of sin. Not only was one goat sacrificed for cleansing, the other goat was set free as a way of saying that your sins are now forgiven. But where does imputation take place in that illustration? When the high priest laid his hands on that goat's head and confessed the sins of the nation, he was saying that the sins of the people are now placed on this goat's account. So this morning we are going to talk about the righteousness of God and how we as sinners are made right before God. And we're made right before God because our sins were imputed to Christ. And he died for our sins and he took our sins away. Therefore, through the sacrifice of Christ, we know what? Through his shedding of blood, shedding of blood we know that now there is an avenue for us to be made right with God. And not only that, when we are made right with God through the shed blood... Our sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. That's what that scapegoat pictured. Your sins are gone. They're they're remembered no more. So our sins were imputed to Christ. And his righteousness was imputed to us. God placed our sins on Christ's account. And he places Christ's righteousness to our account. So the question is, is okay, with that understanding, how in the world, though, do we receive imputation? How are, I understand that that the Old Testament Day of Atonement was a picture of imputation. It was a, it, it was a symbol of, of redemption and the forgiveness of sin, which Christ fulfilled. But, but how do I receive that? How do I receive that? How is that righteousness accounted to me? We're going to talk about that today. Now, in the context of this passage of Scripture, remember, he's writing to both a Jew and a Gentile audience. So he wants the Gentiles to understand the gospel of justification. He wants them to understand that they have been grafted in to the Old Testament promise of Abraham through the gospel. They are part of a rich heritage now. But he also wants the Jews to understand that Abraham, their forefather, was justified by faith, not by works. Why? Because the Jews believed at this point That in order for a man to be right with God, there are certain things they must do. We've already looked at some of these already in the book of Romans. For example, Jews thought, well, in order to be right with God, you you had to be a Jew, and then you had to be circumcised, and you had to keep the law. So they believed that it was Jesus plus these other things. And they would say that Abraham was their example. They would say Abraham was justified by his works. Therefore, works are important to our justification. Therefore, in order to be right with God, they would say, in order to have righteousness imputed to your account, you must believe in Jesus and work for it. And Paul is saying, no, no, no. 
You have a complete misunderstanding of salvation. You have a complete misunderstanding of justification. You have a complete misunderstanding of imputed righteousness. As a matter of fact, you have a complete misunderstanding of Abraham. Now the question that I want to ask is, Paul's going to use two Old Testament people in order to prove justification by faith. He's going to look at Abraham, and he's going to look at David. He only looks at David briefly. He spends most of his time looking at Abraham. So the question is, is why does Paul choose Abraham as an example? I believe there's a couple of reasons for that. I believe he chose Abraham because, after all, Abraham was the founding father of Israel. Abraham was held in high regard by the Jews. They were, he was the rock from which they were hewn, in other words. He was the one who was given the promise and uh, the Old Testament sign of circumcision as a sign of the covenant. Secondly, I believe that God, or Paul chose Abraham because, uh, as I said before, the Jews held Abraham in high esteem. They believed that he was the epitome of righteousness. They also believe that Abraham was justified by works, and that's the reason he was right with God. So Paul is going to actually look at Abraham, this, the, the, the founder of their faith, the one who received the covenant promises. He's going to look at the one who was right with God, and he's going to help them. They've misinterpreted Old Testament history. They've misinterpreted the gospel, and so Paul is going to set the history right it's not a revision no history revision here but just a proper understanding of true biblical history here's the thing I want you to understand this morning and this is what the Jews needed to understand if you think that Abraham gained anything before God by anything that he did then you have failed to comprehend the truth. That's a fact. If you think Abraham was just before God because of something he did, you've you've missed it. So, one of the things that you're going to see is that the book of Romans presupposes a familiarity With the Old Testament figure of Abraham. So Paul does not go into detail talking about Abraham. He assumes that his audience is already familiar with who Abraham is. Now I believe in order for us to understand the story of Abraham. There are at least four key scenes that we need to remember in the life of Abraham. First of all, Abraham was called by God to leave his home. God promised to show him another land to give him a large posterity and through him to bless all the earth. You remember that? That's the first scene. God called Abraham to leave his family and go to the promised land and God would bless him. That's the first scene. The second scene that's important about Abraham is more specific. Not only did God promise that he would give him a land and a large posterity, God promised to give him a specific land. It was actually the, uh, the land of Cana that God would give him. And though he was still childless, his children would be as numerous as the dust of the earth and the stars in the sky. That's the second thing I want you to remember. The third thing I want you to remember about Abraham, and this is the point of this morning's passage, is that even though Abraham was 99 years old and Sarah was 90, God confirmed to them both That they would have a son. And Abraham's name was changed to Abram, to Abraham. And that he would be the father of many nations, which is what that name means. And God gave him a circumcision as a sign of that promise. So that's, that's really, if you take those four scenes, and here's the fourth one. That although Paul only hints at this, God tested Abraham's by faith. Tested Abraham's faith by having him offer up his son Isaac, right? That's the fourth scene. But the point of this morning's emphasis is that third scene. 
Not the call of Abraham to leave his family. Not the promise of the promised land. But the third scene, that you are going to bear a child in your old age, and he will be, or you will be, the father of a great nation. That's the promise that God made Abraham. That's the issue in this morning's passage. So if we consider those things, now we are going to come and we're going to talk about, okay, now that we have an understanding of who Abraham was in light of Old Testament history, how was Abraham justified before God? How was he made right before God? How was he justified? And that's what the Bible is going to teach us this morning. So if you're looking at verses 1 through 8, Paul is going to tell his Jew and Gentile audience that Abraham was not justified by works. Abraham was not justified by works. Look there. He says, what shall we say was gained by Abraham? Our forefather according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Abraham, or I love what he says in verse 3. For what does the scripture say? So here was this misconception. That in order to be right with God, there were certain things that you had to do. And the Jews used Abraham as their proof text. They would say, for example, if you look at our forefather Abraham, he was justified by his works. And I love what Paul does here. He says, but what does the Bible say? I understand that's your tradition. I understand that's what you've believed for so long. Uh, But I want to ask you a question. What does the Bible say? What does the, the Bible actually teach? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves. We live in a world today of of child sacrifice, we live in a day of where critical race theory is being promoted across our land, and we have Christians who have bought into compromise, and we need to get back to that point in our lives where we ask the question to ourselves, and we ask the question of others, I understand that's what you've always believed, I understand that's what you're being led to believe, I understand that's what you want to believe, but my question to you is this, What does the Bible say? And the Bible tells us that Abraham was not justified by works. Righteousness was not imputed to him by anything that he had done. As a matter of fact, Paul makes that clear. He says... Verse 2, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But, not before God. Oh, if he wants to brag about things he's done to be right with God, if he wants to boast to others, That he's right with God because he's done certain things, because he reads his Bible, or because he's a church member, or he's been baptized. If he wants to boast to others about those things, let me tell you, he might be able to boast to other people, but he's not going to be able to boast before God. Why? Because God knows the truth. And what's the truth? Is that we are made right with God, we are made just before God, our sins are forgiven, and we are redeemed, not By anything we have done. As a matter of fact, he says, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And then he gives us the answer. Here's what the Bible says. So quoting here from Genesis, Paul brings that Old Testament passage into this text And he quotes from Genesis and he says, here's what the Bible says. Abraham believed God and it was counted. There's that imputed. It was counted to him as righteousness. 
The only thing that Abraham did, if you want to use that word, to be just before God, to be made right before God, was believe. Paul's going to say that justification is by faith, not by works. What was it that Abraham believed? The promise. And what was the promise? That in their old age they would bear a son, and through that son he would be the father of a great nation. He believed the promise. And because he believed the promise of God, it was counted to him as righteousness. Now I love what Paul goes on to do here. He says in verse 4, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as, is, as what's due. There's two, way to ha- there's two ways for you to have money accounted to your banking account. One way is for you to work for it, and they put your paycheck by way of direct deposit into your banking account. Now, do you see that as a gift or a wage? You've worked this week, you put in the hours, and now your employer, he puts your paycheck. Into your banking account. That's not a gift, is it? You earned it. That's a wage. The only thing that we've earned for ourselves is death. For the wages of sin is death. Death is what we've earned. Another way for you to have money accounted to your account is for someone to gift it to you. Let's say you go to the bank this week and your check has been deposited and your check is for $550. And that's all you expect to see in your account is $550. But let's say when you go to the bank, there's not $550 in there, there's $2,000. And you're going to say, hopefully you would say something, right? And you may be thinking to yourself, where did this extra money come from? And then you find out that someone who loves you and cares about you, not because of anything that you've done, they've gifted you the extra. They earned it, but they're giving it to you. All you have to do is what? Receive it. That's what Paul is telling us here about justification. He's saying justification, you have not earned justification. You have not earned the right to be just before God. You haven't. There's no way you can be righteous before God through through your heritage or by anything that you've done. But Christ made a way when there was no way. Christ is the one who earned our justification. Christ is the one who who makes us righteous before Christ is the one who allows righteousness to be imputed to our account. That's the way salvation is what? A gift. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So righteousness is imputed to us as a gift that is received by faith. Now, I want to tell you why this is important. I got way too much notes here, so I'll just have to get through them. But I do want to explain to you the difference between what we believe and what Catholics believe. Can I do that for a moment? We believe in what is known as, let me use some theology, forensic justification. That's what we believe in. Forensic. You think about forensic science. What do scientists do? They forensic science, they study the facts. They take into account the facts. And through their findings, someone is either what? 
They're not the one who charges someone to be guilty or not guilty. All they do is collect the facts and they give it to the prosecutor or to the defense attorney or whoever it may be. And then it's their responsibility to argue the case based upon what? The facts. All the forensic scientist does is accumulate the facts. Forensic justification. God takes the facts of what Christ has done and by faith places it on our account. It's a gift. Not by anything that we have done. We are sinful and separated from God. But through the finished work of Christ, you take his cross, you take his blood, you take his burial, or his death, his burial, and his his resurrection. You take those facts of what Christ has done, and by faith, they are given to you. As if you did them. You see, here's the problem with Roman Catholicism. They call that a faulty righteousness or a fake righteousness. You see, because here's the reasoning of the Roman Catholic Church. They're saying in order for God to count somebody as righteous who hasn't done anything, it's fake. There's no way God would ever count someone as righteous. They would call it legal fiction. There's no way you would call someone righteous who does not have righteousness. So we believe that we are justified by faith apart from works. Whereas they believe that you're justified by faith and works. We say there's absolutely nothing that you can do to earn favor with God. As a matter of fact, there's none righteous, no, not one. And it is a gift of God. Justification is a gift of God that is accounted to us through the finished work of Christ. Or as a result of the finished work of Christ that is received by faith. Catholics, that's legal fiction. God would never do that. That's why you have the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. There are certain things that you must do. You see, we believe that a person is justified and then sanctified. Correct? They believe that you're sanctified, then justified. That is the difference. It's a false gospel. It's a false gospel. It's the gospel. It's not even the gospel, but it's what Paul talked about in Galatians when he said, let anybody that preaches to you a different gospel, or if I even preach to you a different gospel, let that person be accursed. Make no mistake about it. In my understanding, and I know this is offensive, but it's truth. The Catholic Church is an apostate church. It preaches a false gospel. It's a works-based salvation. And we clearly see the truth of that in the book of Romans. But here's what, and by the way, this is something that was, do you realize the Protestant Reformation was built on this doctrine? (laughs) Do you know what Protestant means? To protest the Catholic Church. Why did they protest? Over the, justi- over the issue of justification by faith. It's the whole purpose behind the Protestant Reformation. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in, f- in Christ alone. Christ plus nothing. And Abraham is our example. God made a promise to Abraham, and Abraham what? Believed by faith, and it was counted to him as righteousness. I love what Donald Gray Barnhouse says about in his commentary on Romans. So for those of us who have been justified by faith, who are made right with God as a gift, 
Barnhouse says this, Therefore I have been made supernaturally pleasing in the sight of God, and that is what I am. I am redeemed, justified, and saved. From now on I must recognize the nobility of my position and live in the light of that grace. Isn't that good? He says, I realize now that I am, I am who I am. Supernaturally pleasing now in the sight of God. That's who I am now. I am redeemed, justified, and saved. Because of the finished work of Christ. And now because I am in this noble position as an adopted child of God, I must live my life in the light of that grace. I must live as one who is supernaturally pleasing to God. I must live as one who is redeemed and justified and saved. Now, of course, he says, using, now he's going to use the example of David, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteousness apart from the works. He says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Omnomnia is the word, without the law. He's saying, blessed are those who, are, who believe, who live against the law. Those who are lawless. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. And whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord does not count his sin. You already have sin on your account. But by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he does not count sin to your account. You know what he counts? Righteousness to your account. That is absolutely mind-boggling to me. But it's true. He just talked about Abraham's faith in verses 1 through 4. Abraham believed and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Then he quotes David. Blesses man whose lawless deeds are forgiven. You know the verse. Sins are covered. So what's the connection between Abraham and David? Here it is. Your lawless deeds are forgiven. Your sins are covered, and the Lord does not count sin against you by faith. That's the promise. And that promise is received by faith. Just like Abraham believed and it was accounted to him as righteousness, so we have the responsibility to believe. And when we do, by faith, it is counted to us as righteous. So now we stand before God, as Barnhouse said, as those who are supernaturally pleasing to the Lord, redeemed and forgiven and saved. And you say, well, how can God do that? Because he's taken all the evidence. He's taken the finished work of Christ and Christ's righteousness. And he's placed it on your account. So when the banker goes to your account and he says, wait a minute, there's not $550 in here. There's $2,000. Okay, that's their account. That's their money. So now when God comes to your account, he says, I don't see sin, I see righteousness. By faith. So Abraham was not justified by works. Verses 9 through 12, I'm just going to give you the synopsis because we've already dealt with this in previous sermons. Not only was Abraham not justified by works, he was not justified by circumcision. Here's the argument that Paul makes in verses 9 through 12. Are you ready for it? Circumcision came after God had already counted Abraham as righteous. That's the argument. God made a promise to Abraham and Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. So he was already declared righteous when God gave the sign of circumcision as a sign of the covenant. So where the Jews have it 
backwards. They're saying, well, wait a minute. He obeyed God and was circumcised. Therefore, God counted it as righteousness. No, no. Read your Bible. What does the Bible say? It's not sanctification, then justification. Which is the same misunderstanding that is in Catholicism. No, it's justification, then sanctification. He believed and was made right with God, therefore he obeyed. Why is that important? Because you know what, we can pick on Roman Catholicism, but we could also say the same thing about many who are in Baptist churches who base their salvation on the fact that they've been baptized or they're a church member. Or because they do good things. They serve in a certain area of ministry. No. Justification is by faith. He's also going to tell us in verses 13 through 17. That Abraham was justified or was not justified by the law. He was not justified by the law. Because the law did not come until when? When? Moses, Moses pre-existed, or Abraham pre-existed Moses. So how in the world could Abraham be justified by keeping the law? He wasn't. As a matter of fact, when you look at your Bibles there in verse 13, he says, for the promise to Abraham and their offspring that he would be heir, that he did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. His righteousness did not come by obedience. As a matter of fact, uh, he said, if you look there at verse 9, is this the blessing only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he was circumcised? It was before he was circumcised. And now he comes to us in verse 13. He says, for the promise of Abraham and for his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law. But through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherence of the law. For if it is the adherence of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. There would be, there would be no need for, for faith if you could earn righteousness. For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why, can we be any clearer, verse, verse, uh, verse 16, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Not only is Abraham the father of the Jew, he's the father of the Gentile, and he's our father. So we look to Abraham and we ask the question, how was Abraham made right with God? Through imputed righteousness. And how did he receive that? By faith. So once again, we are reminded of the anthem of the Protestant Reformation. That Abraham was justified by grace through faith in Christ. Faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And then lastly, he's going to tell us how Abraham was justified. Verse 17. As it is written... I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, talking about Abraham, in hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of a nation as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. What? You believe? Hope against hope. He says, That's the, the same way you were justified, Abraham, is the same way your offspring is going to be justified. By faith. He says no distrust made in verse 20. Him wavering concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith. And he gave glory to God. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. But also it will be counted 
to us who believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespass and raised for our justification. So God's righteousness is, is revealed through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And we are justified by faith. Thus, or through imputed righteousness. So, I ask you this morning, are you trusting in anything other than Jesus for your righteousness? Are you trusting in Jesus for anything? Or trusting in anything other than Jesus for your justification? Abraham's faith is to be our faith. We too are, believe, are to believe God. We are too are to place our faith in the finished work of Christ. We walk away from this passage, and you know what we see? We see our need for justification because of sin. We see the basis of our justification, Christ. And we see the means of our justification, faith. The need, sin. The basis, Christ. The means, faith. So my question right now is, do you stand right before God? Do you have the imputed righteousness of Christ placed on your account? It's a yes or no question. And those of us who have, let me leave you with this. Question 60 of the Heidelberg Catechism, 19, or 1563, ask, ask the question, how are you made righteous before God? And then here's the answer. Here's the answer. Only by true faith in Jesus Christ, even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of, having, and have, and of never having kept any of them and of still being inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without any merit of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. As if I had never sinned, nor been a sinner. And as if I had been perfectly obedient, as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is accept this gift. With a believing heart. Isn't that good? You should contemplate that. I say to those of us here today. If you are not saved. You stand wicked before God. And guilty of sin. But he opens his arms to you today. And he offers you salvation. By grace through faith. Will you receive it? Will you trust in Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? During this time of invitation, I pray that you would come and receive Christ by faith. And those of us who are saved, yes, we admit that we have grievously sinned against God and that we have failed to keep His commandments even still. And that even still, there are times when we are inclined toward evil. Nevertheless, without any merit of our own, out of the sure grace of God, God grants and credits to you and me perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness. As if we had never sinned or been a sinner. As if I had been perfectly obedient as Christ had been obedient. And all we had to do is accept it with a believing heart. Amen. Father God, we commit this time to you in the powerful name of Jesus. May we respond as your spirit leads. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and come as the Lord?